Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am so excited. I mean, more excited than usual. I always say that, but seriously, I am here with my friend Tara Brisky, and we have been talking about how we have known each other for nine years, which seems like an eternity in the online world because we have never met in person. Uh, (laughs) I just got an opportunity to meet a bunch of my Academy members in person for the first time, most of them. And I had known them for a lot of them for nine years. And I was like, yeah, and I've never met Tara and I've never met uh, Kayla, who's my community manager now. And they're like, no way, you know, this is how the online world is. Um, so, you know, we feel like we really know each other, but we've never met each other in person, but we really do know each other because we've done so much together. Um, and I just want to mention on the front of here, um, we're going to talk about some really great information about, uh, booking gigs. And I've had Tara on several podcast episodes in the past. She has been a coach in my, uh, community, the female musician Academy. Um, And so she has been on several episodes of the female entrepreneur musician, and she's also been on episode number 27 of the profitable musician. So if you want to look those up, if you want to expand upon what we're talking about today, uh, those are all really good episodes about this topic, most of them. Um, Mm -hmm. But of course, we are also talking about her book that just came out. So I'm going to let her talk (laughs) a little bit about that throughout the episode Um, But just as an intro, if you guys have never heard from Tara before, I want to make sure that you you know her background. She has been a performing artist booking herself for a very long time, um, Mm -hmm. an an indie artist. So I want to let her give a little bit of background on that before we jump into her new book. Yeah, well, thank you, (laughs) Brie. I am excited to be on here today, too, just to be able to see you. And like Brie said, we we have never met in person, but it doesn't matter. Feels like, you know, longtime friends. Um, So yeah, I just to let you guys know who I am. I am a full time musician. I have been for over 25 years. I started booking gigs when I was 15 years old because I grew up in a musical family and kind of branched out in high school with my brother. Um, So that was back in the day with, you know, no computers. Um, You had to send out cassette tapes. (laughs) Physical mail, press mail. mail, yes. I know. And, um, and I really didn't know what I was doing. And sometimes I still feel like that. But honestly, I have through the years really honed those skills because I wanted to perform so badly. And I just, I really, one of my heart, I think, or part of my heart is just to help other musicians realize that you can book gigs. And uh, right now, I mean, probably the last 15 years, I've been doing about between 100 to 200 gigs a year, uh, except for 2020, of course. But even that year, I think I did about 40 something gigs, um, a lot of them online. And um, I continue to just help support even other musicians in their booking process. And then I'm booking gigs. And I've also, I book as a solo artist, uh, a duo with my brother. And then I'm also part of a tribute show um, in the last couple of years, although I don't book for that one. But um, I've really, really tried to have been even honing my skills more all the time to figure out like what really works and what doesn't. Um, Because I want people to know that, again, it is possible when I say 100 to 200 gigs a year, it really has been consistent through that. And um, I've learned a few things that I want that to be able to help others to know, hey, here's how you here's how you get started or here's how you uh, get going or come back to it. And I, I just want to say something at the top end of this is that because um, I know, Brie, your show goes out to a lot of different people. And please don't ever think that age has anything to do 
with getting gigs or not. I, I just talked to a gentleman um, who used to be a part of the group called the Trashmen, which I wasn't familiar with, but they were popular in the 60s. He is 82 years old and he's still gigging. And so why not? <laughs> That is so awesome. And, you know, I, I I have a lot of older people in my academy as well. And you've worked with a lot of them. And yeah, many of them are thriving there. You know, yes. they're out there booking gigs constantly. So it definitely has nothing to do with age. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we can we can show that we have so much experience. Yes. At this age. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> And just, and I think just the, not even the experience of being in front of audiences, but when you have something to tell, we also have sh stories to share, whether it's in our songs or just telling them, but it's, it's just life. And yeah. that's really a great thing. So yeah, w no matter what age you are at, if you're listening and again, if you're older, whatever that is, because who cares what age is, you know, it's more in the mind, but I, I just think it's possible. And I'm, I'm living proof and just to be, I, I don't mind saying my age, but I'm 55 and to be kind of feeling like I'm thriving right now in gigs. And I really do. Um, this is, I, I had no idea that that would be possible even in my fifties. And a lot of the people I work with are even in their sixties. So yeah, absolutely. Fun. I have artists in their seventies that are still performing. Yeah. And like you said, that 82 year old, I mean, that 82 year old guy is 30 years older than me to think that I could still be performing in 30 years, which would yeah. be fantastic. <laughs> Love it. It's so cool. Yes. Uh, and so Tara and I, you know, we'd known each other. She'd been on my podcast. And then in 2017, you know, I had been helping other people uh, build courses because I'd built a bunch of courses. And, yes. and I saw that she was thinking about that. And I'm like, Hey, you know, let's, let's see if we can do that. And so she built a great course around booking and a lot of my students took that course and, um, you know, so, and I had her in, in the Academy as a coach and all that stuff, because she, so just so you know, she really knows what she's talking about, but what's so cool is that she's just written a book on this subject and making this mm -hmm. information even more accessible to people. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that book, Tara. Um, I know what it is to write a book. There's my book back there on the shelf. Um, yes. <laughs> the Musician's Profit Path. It is not an easy thing. It's like, oh yeah, you just write down what you know. It's not that easy. So I'd love to know a little bit about that process. And then, you know, just let them know like the name of the book, kind of yes. a sense of what's in there. And then we'll dig into some of the chapters. Yeah. And I'm just going to, because I have a proof copy here, I'll show you guys today. Um, it's called 20 must have booking tips. Every musician needs It's a step-by-step -step guide to level up your booking. And, and to be honest, I, when I was even thinking about a book a couple of years ago, it was partly because I was just thinking about a book, like a way to get some of these ideas out where if somebody didn't want to commit to a whole course, they could still have the, the same ideas. And so I went about it. I pulled things, um, I'll be honest, from my course and tried to think about like, what are some of the most practical steps? Because you guys, I am all about practicality. Um, and so I thought also people probably don't like to read. <laughs> I know a lot of people. So I made it, I made it short and I, I, I wanted just kind of a no muss, no fuss uh, book that could help you. A, if you had never done any booking at all that you could jump in because of it. And even if you had B, <laughs> um, done some booking that it might encourage you to keep on, or if there's things that you had questions about to go, Oh, okay. That's what you mean by like follow-ups or, um, you know, I have different chapters and I'll just say this, like I, I did a couple of chapters just dedicated to even like the money aspect of booking or the organizational aspect. Um, or even just, um, what was the other thing I was thinking of? Oh, just building relationships with people, you know, as you're booking, because those are things that I've basically kind of said, you know, what have I learned through the years? What do I think would be helpful for others? And how can I get that across? And like you say, Brie, talk about a process. Yeah. It's, as you know, when you write a book, it's, it's trying to be succinct. You have to edit it, proof it. And, uh, and I even put in mine, I, I was trying to, I'll just show here, but I have like photos just to make it a little more visually appealing sometimes if, you know, for those of you, especially who don't 
maybe enjoy reading as much. So, and I have it in paperback and ebook, but um, that's kind of what got me started on that process of just getting it out to people where, again, maybe you don't want to commit to a course, but you want some practical aspects of booking. Yeah. I mean, I love the the book option. Same thing with me. Like I got all that stuff from my course. Right. But yeah, but you, you know, people want to learn in different ways. Some people like yes. video, some people like really like that hands-on coaching that they need in a course, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. they read a book and then, then, just, then they're just like, you know, deer yeah, in the headlights, right? Like they need <laughs> right. help applying right. it. Right. So it's, it right. makes sense that you pulled that stuff from there. Um, and it allows people kind of a gateway and they're like, oh my gosh, I really love her stuff. I'd love to work more with her, that kind of thing. So that's really the way books can, can work and get the information out to more people that maybe, you know, can't, yeah. don't have the time for a course, can't, you know, don't have right. the money, et cetera. Right. Um, so one thing that you have really been known for, especially in my com- in community is kind of uncovering those outside of the box kind of gigs, like finding mm-hmm. places that you can perform that you might not have thought of that are a little more niche. How does somebody kind of look at like the kind of music that they do, um, the kind of performance that they do, and then kind of try to find some outside of the box kind of gigs that aren't just like restaurants and, you know, traditional venues? Yeah, I I think... I think it's a good point when you say actually looking at your music, because one of the things I have have talked about through the years and even a little in the book is that the, whatever your niche is, and when I say even niche, I understand that some of you, it may not fall really nicely and neatly into one niche of music. I don't even, I've got jazz and Broadway and sometimes a little bit of folk or even classical. So, but just kind of looking at your music and saying, you know, what, what do I want? Like, what kind of an audience am I looking for? Are you, I tell people sometimes, are you looking for to be in the background? Like, do you want to just kind of be, you know, in the back of the room and you want to play, but you don't really want the pressure of people looking at you? Or are you trying to really communicate something to your audience? Are you telling stories? Are you, do you have songs that you feel like, I really want them to listen? Because some of the venues and places will be different with how that pans out. You might go to, for instance, I'll just say like a winery. And for some people that might be very, it might be a little bit of both of background music and yet people are still listening. So it might ease you into that way. But, you know, if you're, if you're somebody you say, I want an audience who is listening. Um, For instance, some of the senior places that I go to, they are there, they are there to listen and they're very enthusiastic. And so it's kind of, yeah, understanding yourself, but also where you, th- where you think you might thrive. Sometimes you just have to try it out because you don't know. But I think trying to, to think about yourself as a person, like, what are you looking for? Because obviously some audiences just aren't going to fit. I don't go to breweries because I know that they're looking for usually a uh, country or rock mm-hmm. <laughs> and at least here in Minnesota. And, um, they're also, you know, if they're also a little bit just more background, like people are just talking the whole time. And so you have to kind of know that about yourself or at least explore that just so that you're finding gigs that feel like it feels purposeful and that you you're able to give something, but also to, to be enjoying it as well. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Like, do you want to tear down that fourth wall or do you want to be just kind of this self-contained like music thing going on over here because yeah. there are different levels of that right if you're yes. at a senior place like you know they really might want you to like interact and like get to know the people if you keep coming back it's like oh there's mary over there hi mary how are you doing right. today? you know in between the right. songs that kind of thing or do you just want yeah. to play your music and leave right <laughs> <laughs> it's true and even knowing like does your music fit more of an intimate audience or Mm -hmm. an outside? I know that when my brother and I play, uh, we play at parks in the summer, like where it's, um, it's a community coming together for an event. They have like a weekly thing in the park and those two people come and bring their own chair. Like they are coming to listen and yet they're not usually humongous audiences. They still feel a little bit intimate and, and casual, but It's that would be, you know, different if somebody was maybe playing a festival and 
it's just a different expectation, even of the audience or who you're playing to. Yeah. And also what, what do you want to play? Like, do you only want to yeah. play originals or do you, are you okay with playing right. covers? Yeah. And I, I have to be honest, you guys, that I, even if you're a singer songwriter, I always tell people, and you can disagree with me if like you can Brie or, or whoever listens, but I always say throw in some covers and oh, the reason no, I totally agree. Yeah. I, I figured you would, but I do just because that cover is what gives you commonness with the audience. You know, it's like if you're uh, having a conversation with someone you have never met and you find that one little piece of commonness, it makes you then sometimes want to talk more. And it's the same thing with the audience. If they can find that one little bit of commonness, then they're probably more willing to listen to their songs of, you know, that you've written that they don't know. Yep. No, I absolutely agree. I don't, I don't care who you are. I think throwing in even, you know, Zach Brown band does covers at their concerts <laughs> just to have that thing that people can sing along. To. I mean, everybody knows their songs too, but like, right. you know, it's just fun to do that sometimes. It is. It is. Um, okay. So I'm looking at this list of chapters and I'm super okay. interested in chapter nine, getting okay. creative, getting creative unusual ways to contact venues. I would love to know even just one way that you think is unusual. Cause I think, and, and also on the same subject, it's like artists don't, they don't want to like put themselves out there in a way where they can feel that rejection. So a lot of times they're just like slide into the DMS or like just send out <laughs> a mass number of emails and hope for the best because they don't want to have to face someone and get a no, even over the phone or in person. So let's talk about that, like contacting venues and how that's uncomfortable and how we can get around that. And then some maybe unique ways to do that. Okay. So I, I got to tell you guys that even when I do some of these more, you know, just different ways, it doesn't mean I'm not scared doing it. You need to know that because there's still times where I think, oh, did I just say something wrong? Or, you know, did that look stupid? <laughs> And all those things go through your mind, like we're human. So that's going to happen. But one of the things that I do and have done and have gotten gigs from is when you talk about like the DMs on a phone um, in social media is to go to the page of an event, go to their message part and do an audio message or even a video message. And I know scary, scary and video. Sometimes I don't do if I don't have any makeup on or something, but um, but even audio, and here's why, here's why I think it, it works. I mean, it's just cause you all are performers already and usually musicians, like even when we talk, we tend to have a little bit more, uh, in what do I want to say? Inflection in our voices, just with the pitches. Um, you can also sound very kind. Like if I smile, hopefully you can notice that than if I don't smile and talk like this. And so you're giving a personality, you know, so often I understand we would just want to throw out an email because it's the easiest thing to do. We don't have to worry about any initial response right away. But at least in the DMs, when you do like an audio message or a video message, if you are fearful about, you're not talking to them in real time, in a sense, they, there's still going to be some kind of downtime in between that. So you can kind of get ready for whatever they say. But again, it just gives a personality. And I remember doing this, um, it was at a restaurant, uh, weirdly. So this was a couple years ago and I went into their DMS. I did an audio message for that one. And they were very intrigued and then said, oh, well, here, can you email this person? Because that sounds really interesting. So that's why I'm saying just try. The other thing is we don't ever know which way um, someone is going to respond to how we reach out to them, because there are a lot of different ways. Mm. And yeah. I think it's important to try. Sometimes you have to try different ways even to reach out to somebody. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like hit him on, on several different, maybe email and the DMS and mm -hmm. leave a phone message or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and like not to be annoying. Like you don't want to keep doing that all the time on all three channels, but right. You know, just be like, Hey, I also left you a phone message just in case that's a better way to connect with you, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I love about the, the audio messages, first of all, the, they're not, they're probably not going to just delete your message or respond unfavorably to you. If no. you've taken the trouble to leave them an audio message, it does feel like you're on the phone with somebody when someone does that. 
-hmm. And it's really hard to like press the delete button or, or like, just go not interested. You know what I mean? They're at least going to respond to, Oh, thank you for, you know, reaching out. Like, I'm not sure there's a good fit at this time. Like that's the kind of thing I would expect a response from right. someone who takes the trouble to do a audio message. Secondly, I just realized that this podcast exists today between us because you sent me an audio message and <laughs> because you just do that now, right? You're always like, right. I really need to be, get better about doing that because you just naturally do it. And when mm -hmm. I got an audio message from you, I don't, I don't think I was at home. I was somewhere out and I was like, oh, but Tara sent me an audio message. It must be important. So I mm -hmm. listened to it right away. Mm -hmm. And then I responded right away because I, you know, I knew you took the trouble to do that. And I wanted to make sure to not forget to respond and stuff. So I just, I think it adds a little more weight for you yes. to take that personal initiative to do that. Well, and it's different. I think, you know, like I say, the majority of people will reach out via email and, and sometimes people are looking for that. So I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying that do something that's different so yeah. that yeah, like so I said, someone... you can do both and there might be different mm -hmm. people that are manning their email versus yes. their social media. And then the person who mans the email, like just might be overwhelmed by the, all the pitches. So they're not paying yes. attention, but then the person who mans the social media is very impressed with the way you approach them. And so they would forward it to that person and they would actually listen, you know, you never know what's going mm -hmm. on behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just always think try different ones. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. Okay. So chapter 10, this is another big one, knowing uh -oh. your worth, setting your gig fees with confidence. Okay. So there's a lot that you packed into here, but I just wanted to pull maybe one thing out of there. Like what is one big mistake that artists make when they're talking to venues and trying to negotiate their fees? Well, there's first probably a of lot all... of them. Cause I know I made a million in the beginning. <laughs> Me too. Um, I think that even just when we talk about negotiating, and again, I th I do think we want to find uh, an agreement of, you know, what our price is and then what people are going to pay us. But I, I don't even sometimes like the word negotiation um, for fees because I feel like ultimately you should set a, f a price that you're happy with. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think, and you were asking about what mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. that artists tend to make. I think that most artists think that they're going to, you know, if they put a price out there, they're afraid that, oh no, was that too high? So maybe before they put it out, they might suddenly change their mind for one thing and put out a lower price. And the thing is you can never raise your price once you've put that lower oh, price yeah. out. But if you, if you throw out a higher price, you can always come down, you know, if, if they're not, if they're saying, well, that's too high. And I think, so I think that's one thing. And I think the other thing is that as artists, a lot of times we don't break down the price, even in our own mind, like what, you know, cause a lot of times people think, well, you're just singing for an hour or you're just singing for two hours. It's like, well, actually not. I prepped, I learned songs, I wrote songs. Um, I have experience of practice all through the years, the setup, the takedown, the drive time. I mean, and the thing is for all of you to remember, I think that, and, and we don't always think about this, but you don't get paid, first of all, too, until you've done the gig usually, which means everything you've done up to that moment from the first call or the first email, you know, to when you actually play, there is a lot of time in between there that an effort. And so all of that needs to be reflected somehow in your price. And I think if anything, artists tend to price themselves too low. And, and again, I'm, I'm saying you also need to take stock of, you know, who you are as an artist and how long you've been performing. And so you don't want to just throw out some massive price when maybe that doesn't reflect it, but I think it's just really trying to break down and then also breaking down for the, um, the venue itself to help them understand, well, here's what goes into my price. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, I, I've thought about this so many times of projects like house projects, because that's what I see people doing a lot where when you get a bid on something, like, let's say you want to, you know, redo your bathroom or, or whatever in your house, they're going to give you a price and then they're going to kind of break down what that price entails, whether it's like putting in a new tub or, you know, they're painting or whatever that might be. 
there's a price for every little thing. And I think as musicians, that's something we're just not used to doing. And, and I encourage you to do it because it's so much more helpful, even to the place that's going to book you to understand it isn't just the hour you're there or two or three, you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, no. And I mean, I'm thinking for myself as a worship director at a church, like Mm -hmm. I'm not just paid on Sunday, right? Am I just paid to show up and and do the two services on Sunday? No, Mm -hmm. I'm actually paid for all of my prep time for working with the musicians that I work with sometimes that are singing with me, um, for picking the songs, for getting all the music organized, for getting, you know, all the lyrics to the person that does the bulletin and the slides, et cetera. Like there's a lot behind that one one hour thing that I do two times on Sunday. And so as an employee of the church, I'm paid accordingly. And Mm -hmm. so we need to think, you know, if I just charged for that gig, Mm -hmm. would I just charge, you know, $30 an hour or whatever? No, I couldn't. If I was only being paid just for that gig, I would Mm -hmm. have to charge for the whole, you know, 10 hours or whatever that I worked that week to, right. to get more like 15 hours. Right. So what I really need to charge <laughs> for this gig is like $450, not $150. Right. 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 So you can think about it that way. Like you're your own employee. And so you need to charge for all of the hours that you needed to put into creating that gig. And I just want to add one other thing, because this is another thing um, with pricing. I just thought of, because I'm actually doing this right now. Um, I'm raising my fees this summer. And I do it every couple of years or as I see fit, but I'll tell you something, almost no one, I can't say completely because I had one person that did one time pay me more than I asked for, which was crazy and great, but almost nobody is going to give you a raise Mm -hmm. when you're doing this. So you have to also, you know, think about when people are in other types of work, usually as they go many more years in a job, they will get some kind of raise unless, you know, maybe they're not doing a great job or something, but in general that happens. And as I've told people sometimes, which it's, it's funny when I even just say this to them, well, you know, gas prices have gone up, um, car insurance has gone up. So I, when I start saying things like that, they're totally understanding or even telling them things like I'm still taking voice and piano lessons. So I'm trying to keep getting better at what I do. I'm, I'm adding more to my, um, already the skills I have and to keep it fresh. Like I always say, I want to do a great job for you. So I'm trying to keep educating myself in the process. Also, and that, and that they, all costs money. A lot of those places have other vendors that they work with and they know the prices are going up. Right. <laughs> you know, if they're a winery, then their prices what? are going up for all kinds of things that they're using on a regular basis, including like utilities and, you know. Absolutely. Yes. So So, I, it's, it's not, and it's hard for people to do that, but honestly, I had a a place this summer. I'll just share this quickly that, um, I won't say where it is and I am deciding to do it this summer, but it's a place I've sung for 10 years and they have never raised the fee in 10 years. mm -hmm. Now I get a lot of tips at this place. So for me this year, it was still worth it because I know that I'll get decent tips, but I honestly, even for myself said, you know what, this is the last year I do that price. Like if they don't raise it next year, I'm just going to choose not to do it because I value my time and what I'm giving to people. And, you know, in 10 years for them not to go up, that's crazy. That is crazy. That is crazy. (laughs) And I know that you talked before about a time when you raised your prices and there, you know, most people that said totally worth it. I think there was one person that was like, no, we can't pay Mm -hmm. that. And they mm-hmm. like dropped out. And then like the next year they came back and they're like, okay, we'll take it. You know, we, we missed yes, you. They did. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time. And I, and I've, I've also realized friends, here's the deal too. When you, when you, um, if you raise your price and you lose somebody, you're still going to feel great about the gigs and that you do get, if you just say, oh, I, I guess I won't, you're going to feel frustrated at doing that gig for a lesser price. And you're not going to do a good job and they might not hire you yeah. again here because they're going to notice that you've got that resentment. It's really hard yeah. to hide, honestly. It's true. It's true. <laughs> so. 
So I want to talk about, um, let's see, be your own ad chapter 17. I love this because I got so many gigs by promoting myself at my own gigs, promoting all the types of things that you can do. And I think the biggest thing is you need to let people know when you're at a gig, all the other kinds of gigs that you do, because they might just see you only in that way, mm -hmm. you know? So how do you recommend the artists do that at their gigs without being like all, you know, annoying and, and like, cause <laughs> artists hate to promote themselves. Right. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, being a youngest child, I don't have quite as much problem doing that, but no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding you guys. Um, it's yeah, the youngest child. Sometimes they say we're always the show off ones, but that's not always true either. Um, so I think, uh, one of the, at least one of the, one of the things that I do even to promote myself is simply just having like flyers, little, um, like four by six cards yeah, or business cards. School. I had like black and white flyers that I printed on my yeah. laser. Yeah. People, it's funny though, people will take them because sometimes even I've learned that people don't always want to talk to you about it, but they actually, they still want to know something. And so if it's just out there, it's something they can grab. Um, other people will come up sometimes and literally talk to me and say, Hey, you know, do you do other things? But I don't, when you're in the middle of a concert too, I think it's okay to even talk about other gigs, like even in a story. Well, I did at a place I did this or, or even advertising, you know, actually I just thought of. So in the last couple of gigs I did, um, in early June, I was actually at some senior places, but I, at those places advertised for a, a gig I was doing with my brother. That was at this, it was, it's called crooners, um, supper club, which has become kind of a, uh, a, a venue that has about four theaters and they have a lot of tribute shows and jazz music. Anyway, it's kind of a big deal here in Minneapolis. And so I thought, why not? I'm going to advertise, let them know. And because of even doing that, I literally had a guy that showed up at the concert. I had just seen him at a gig on Monday and he came to my concert Friday at this supper club place. And, um, you just don't know. I think we get so afraid that we're just going to be a bug to people. But actually, when people are hearing you in the moment and you tell them about other places you're singing, it gives them an opportunity for those that really like you to go, oh, oh, I can hear them again or I can hear that person again. Yeah. So it's that's one thing I do. And the other I can bring my husband or I can bring my sister yeah. or my mom or whatever. Exactly. And um, the other thing that I finally have learned to do, even though I've said it for years, I, I don't know why I can't take my own advice. <laughs> um, and I know, Brie, you do this too, is getting um, people on my mailing list, like mm -hmm. giving them the opportunity to sign up, whether it means I have something physical or, um, you know, getting them to my website. But I have gotten also more people on my email list in the last three months than I have probably in the last three years. Oh, good job. You yeah, know, that's finally. My number one thing. I, I, <laughs> I that was like my first priority when I was at gigs is get people on the email list because then they see, you know, what I'm doing on a regular basis. I'm yes. top of mind when they hear from somebody that needs someone or they need someone themselves. And that's the thing. You want that because you don't know what fan is listening to you that's going to turn into somebody that could book you or just simply give your name to somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one important reason I think everybody needs this book is because of the planning side of booking. There's a lot involved. There's a lot of follow up, mm -hmm. you know, having a system of, you know, keeping track of who you've talked to and when you talk to them and when you need to follow up and all of that stuff, but also just understanding like the, the cycle of booking and having it, you know, put into your business cycle. So maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, under, um, chapter 18, the power of, no, of perfect timing in booking gigs, because, you know, I always have this big push in July. Hey guys, you got to think about Christmas. I know it seems a long time away. Um, so what are kind of those cycles in booking that people need to think about? Yeah. And good job of pushing people in July. I literally booked Christmas gigs this week. Already, yeah. I feel like July is starting to be too late. <laughs> well, people still will, but you know what I mean? It's yes. like, 
not too early. And, and, uh, I should probably say Northern hemisphere because I realize that can shift to with, if you're in the Southern right. hemisphere of the world, but I'll just talk mostly to that Northern hemisphere. Cause it's where I am too. So I always think some of the big cycles are yes, June or July, when you're talking about Christmas gigs, anything or holidays, you know, anything of the holidays that can include Thanksgiving too. Um, but I also think when you're talking about like summer gigs, that can, a lot of places it can start in January and February, but I've started to see a trend of bigger events like festivals and places where you actually, it's the fall before. So, or even sometimes up to a year before. Yeah, even sometimes as soon as they finish the event, they yeah. announce, like a lot of times events now, like they'll announce the next one when you're there and they'll like give discounts yeah. if you, you know, sign up for it now. And so then they're already booking for the next one. Yeah. And it's, and it's really important. And it, as a general rule, I would say six months out of just of kind of anything, especially the major holidays, think of like Valentine's day too, cause that's another big one. And if you're, if you're, you know, if you're thinking, oh, January, I'll book for Valentine's day, yeah. not a wise idea. <laughs> so I, and I know for those of you maybe who don't like to plan as much, it, it might feel a little overwhelming that way. But if you can even just kind of think of certain months that you're just going to have to book a little bit more, be a little more focused on, and then the other months you don't have to as much. Honestly, I, I think people get this idea that booking is going to take all your time. Um, and it doesn't have to, I will say up front when you're first discovering places, when you're first introducing yourself, yes, that will take a little more time and effort, but friends, the, the really cool part is that once you get that, yes, and then you start in, you know, ensuing years or months after following up and then getting rebookings, it takes a lot less effort to do those. Oh yeah. It's the whole pushing the snowball up the, up the hill thing. Right. Once it starts going downhill, <laughs> then it starts gathering more snow, more snow, more snow. I mean, you yes. are gathering all these venues that love you. They just immediately mm -hmm. want to book you, you know, and that's where Tara's system really helps. Like you need to follow up right away. Like, Hey, you know, interested yep. in booking again for next year, et cetera. Like you don't want to, you want to keep them in the loop when the excitement is high. Yes. Yeah. And, and you, and you can, and again, like I say, don't, you know, don't let the fear of thinking, oh, it is going to take all my time because it doesn't have to take all your time. And the other thing is, so let's say that you even get 10 places that say, yes, those 10 places could multiply in one year to, you know, maybe 20 events or 30 events, depending how often they book you. That's right. Absolutely. So. Oh man, there's been so much that we've talked about here, but there's still so much more that they can learn from the book. We just barely scratched the surface. So you guys yeah. you need to go to Amazon, remind them again, Tara, the name of the book and where they can find it. Name of the book is 20 must have booking tips. Every musician needs. And I know this is just for those watching. Cause obviously if you're listening, you can't see the, <laughs> the, the, the title or the cover of the book. Um, but it is in available again, both in paperback and ebook on Amazon and, like I said, it's, it's there now for you. I encourage you to get it. Um, if you have any questions, even about just booking in general, please reach out to me. Cause I would love to help you further with that. Absolutely. And then let them know where they can connect with you. I know you're very active on Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you've got a podcast, which is not about booking, but it's still a really, really good podcast that everyone should listen to. So let them know about that. That's called the engaging voice. And it's really about, um, cause I've also taught voice through the years. And so I'm trying to help people in the essence of as you're performing, making sure you've got the voice to be able to do that and keep up with that. So that's called the engaging voice podcast. Um, my biggest, yeah, handles Instagram, Facebook. It's usually at, at Tara Brisky music. That's Can the big one. Like cause they'll never know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. T A R A first name. And then last name B R U E S K E. It looks like brewski, but we pronounce it brisky like a brisk day. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I understand why you wouldn't want to be called brewski. <laughs> right. <laughs> and my <laughs> website, my website, terabrisky.com, same thing. So you can find everything there too, as well. Yeah. And if you're in the Minneapolis area, area, can yeah. you can book her. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and someday Brie and I are actually going to get to meet in person. <laughs> you're coming to California. I'm right. waiting for your tribute show to come to California. Oh, right. <laughs>
because I love Olivia Newton John and Anne Murray. Anne like Murray, yeah. Favorites. Yeah, I know they are. They're great ladies. So, what's your yeah. favorite song to sing in the tribute show? Oh boy. Um. Well, you know, I love the songs from Greece because I do mm-hmm. two duets, um, with another That's gentleman, and th- those are just. I almost don't have it. It's like it changes every time I do the show, just because the sh- the songs are so fun. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> You get to do summer loving had me. I do. (laughs) Okay. That was like the first solo that I ever had singing that. Really? Yeah. 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 That's, that is a fun one. Summer nights. And then, um, uh, you're the one that I want. Oh, that's the other duet that, yeah. I get to be a little sassy in that one. Oh yeah. (laughs) Tell me about it. Stud. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's all. Oh, I gotta see this show. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, this has been so cool catching up. Yeah. Thank um, you. You know, just learning about your book and letting everybody on the podcast know all the things they can learn from the book. So thank you so much, Tara, for spending some time with us today. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you, Brie, for having me. It was such a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.